morning. Uh, welcome to Tokyo. Hopefully the summit's going well for everybody. Um, my name is John Stanford. I am the VP of Software Development at Solinia. Uh, this is Alex Jacobs. He's on my team as a front-end developer. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, data visualization and the process that we've been going through um, uh, as we develop our product called Goldstone. Um, it's um, uh, maybe a little deceptive in the title. We're not going to talk about Horizon much at all. Um, it's a tool that you're probably all familiar with, and, and um, our goal is to talk uh, a little bit more about um, other things uh, that you know, go beyond Horizon when we talk about visualizing data coming out of clouds. Um, so uh, a little bit about our goals for today. Um, one is just to familiarize you know, ourselves with you and you with us. Um, we're all OpenStack people. We're all working in this space. And, and uh, I'll give you a little intro about who I am and what our company does and all that stuff. Um, we want to share some of our experience, mostly about the process of how we look at data and develop, uh, develop visualizations. Um, uh, we want to learn from you. So towards the end of the presentation, we'll leave room for questions and answers. And, and hopefully, we can all interact a little bit. And, and um, share some of uh, your experiences and, and see you know, how this all resonates. So as I said, I'm the uh, VP of development at Selenia, but uh, I'm told we can't work all the time, so I do some other things. I like to hike around in the forests outside of Oakland. Um, I have a beehive out in my yard and pull some honey out of it once in a while. And I have a, a little rack of equipment that I use for experimentation with stuff that doesn't necessarily fall into my day job. Um, the Selenia story is that we're uh, a consulting and product company. We have uh, consulting services in the areas of conceiving and working with uh, cloud strategy at the high level in organizations. We architect and design clouds in a distro agnostic way. So if you're in a state where you don't exactly have a distro choice made, we can help you with those kinds of things. We do uh, cloud integration and, and implementation services as well as um, helping adopt uh, cloud technology. We also offer training services. Uh, training services are in the realms of OpenStack, both core and specialty, and then, uh, geez, Louise, also in uh, uh, Docker and, and CI, CD type of uh, services as well. Um, our area is the project called Goldstone. Goldstone is a tool to help uh, ingest cloud data, logs, events, API, you know, usage, uh, metrics, and that type of thing, and analyze that data, um, give you some reporting tools that help you uh, operate the clouds that you, that you own. The, the tools that we use to do all this stuff are, are the, the typical litany of things you might see in a, in a data pipeline. Um, we're heavily based on Python and, and Django. Uh, we're pulling data out of OpenStack and Docker. Uh, for the front end, which this talk is about, we, we use a lot of Backbone and D3 and JavaScript and things like that. Um, on the way back, you know, we're using Logstash to, to pull in data. Uh, all that's fairly flexible and fluid at the, at the time. As, as we grow, we'll, we'll change the stack as necessary. Um, on the topic of, of data visualization, um, you know, it's, it's really all about the context of your data. So. Um, you know, what kind of environment are you working in? Are you in a dev test, you know, production environment? Um, what are the timing of the events happening in the cloud? Is it, you know, are you seeing things unusual in a time where you're supposed to be in a low demand? Are you seeing things uh, in high demand that, that don't look right? You know, so um, the relationships of events to other things around you in the cloud and the dimension of the data that you need to get a good sense for what's happening. So, you know, part of the challenge of visualization at scale is that there's so many metrics that you need to see to get a real picture of, of the meaningful uh, elements of your data. And, and part of the challenge is getting those key uh, dimensions in a, in, a, in a way that you can make sense of it without too much distraction. And then ultimately, the movement of data over time is, is challenging to, to keep up with. So I'm going to turn it over to Alex, and he can talk about some of the uh, the, the theory and practice around cloud development visualization. Thanks, John. And I want to say good morning and happy to see so many people here. Um, I generally like to describe myself as a musician with a day job. Uh, and the reason for that 
I want to mention is that I made a fairly late life career change over into tech after being a professional musician in healthcare, playing at the bedside for people. And as I was in that process, many people would say to me, uh, you know, musicians make good programmers. And so I would just shrug my shoulders and say, okay. Um, but I'm starting to really understand what that means in terms of uh, whether we're coders or musicians or I think novelists as well, or people who are holding the intangible, creating patterns from things that don't actually exist. Um, and the only reason I wanted to mention all this is it's also a fascination of mine to come to a conference like this and learn more about who are the people that are actually making up OpenStack and making up this community. What are our life experiences beyond this that shape the way we see the world? Because uh, ultimately that's what we are creating in terms of software. So just a brief intro. Um, and now I was going to talk a little bit about theory. And these are some of the things that inform where does this world of data visualization come with it. Uh, obviously, at this stage, nothing started in a vacuum. We're looking back now to uh, principles and design grammar that has been around for quite a long time. So this slide that is showing now, uh, uh, the central image there is something that I snapped a photo of. And what I'm showing in general here on this slide are data visualizations that are not necessarily that compelling or scalable for large sets of or changing sets of data. What is generally represented in a chart like this uh, are low data sets, unchanging data sets, or displays for very particular uh, presentations. So I, um, I'll also show some better examples of uh, typical techniques, but it was interesting to me that there have been many signs around the Tokyo Metro and train stations that even though I was, I was having trouble with the Japanese language, I was still able to understand very clearly what was being presented. And that is what we are going for as a goal in data visualization. Uh, but this one on this slide is an, is an example of one that I really could not figure out whatsoever. Um, and the slide on the left, uh, which I got from a site called viz.wtf, was they, they called this a uh, typical government uh, slide. Um, it's something that presents something. There's data behind it, but what is it actually communicating? If you're sitting there scratching your head, so am I. Uh, and this is what we are, we want to also show examples of things that don't work so we can see a little uh, mix and match. Again, I mentioned the grammar or the vocabulary of data visualization and looking back, a lot of what we are using today comes from people who had mastered these arts from the world of static data, um, literally statistics. Um, and so here's just uh, four in brief that I want to mention who have informed a lot of what we do today. Uh, if we look at the grammar of graphics by Leland Wilkinson, when we look at our, our Microsoft Excel, make me a pie chart, make me a bar chart, or whatever's, whatever it is we're working at, there was a point when someone had to say, well, what are the elements of these graphs? How do we abstract this? And how can we break this down so that we can actually create these visualizations? Um, Wilkinson was one of those people who contributed heavily to those abstractions. And a uh, visualization program called ggplot, or Grammar of Graphics, was based off of his research and his, his design philosophies. Um, so this became a foundation for scientific journals, newspapers, statistical packages, and other data visualization systems. Um, so again, when we see things like radar charts, maps, plots, this is the person who offered up a lot of the theory behind that. Um, and looking at another uh, master collection, uh, the visual display of quantitative information by uh, Tufti, which is a name that you'll probably hear a lot if you look into data viz. And um, from this book, I also highlighted what, what is often considered uh, the, the greatest 
uh, data visualization of all time. Um, and I forget the exact year that this chart is from here. Um, but there, there's, there's a clear representation of, of six different variables going on here. This is uh, Napoleon's march to and from Moscow. And what is being shown here are the size of the army, the location, the direction of movement, temperature, and the location of major river crossings. And so to pack that much information into something so concise that you can sit here and study it and actually figure out the story from that is something that becomes a, a path forward for, for all of us trying to figure out how to do this. Um, let's see. Explanatory, exploratory data analysis by John Tukey. Um, again, this was before we had, uh, you know, MacBooks crunching numbers at blazing speed. This was someone who was coming up with pencil and paper techniques of how to take data sets and uh, come out with summaries or theories about what was being represented by our data sets. Um, so it's, it's, I think, tempting or easy to forget uh, w how far we've come in such a short amount of time with the increase of personal computer power. Um, the elements of graphing data, William Cleveland, um, another uh, explanation of uh, methodology and resources for people doing uh, scientific research. So that's where we've come from. And now that we're moving into you know, um, highly dynamic, large changing data sets, how do we now take those original grammars of visualization and make them something that suits where we are now? Uh, this image at top here was taken from uh, the perceptualedge.com, which is Stephen Few's blog. And he's well known for uh, someone who, who solved some of these problems. When we look at 3D pie charts, uh, that's often something that's sort of the, the classic bad example of taking an old style of representing graphics and um, so he, here's, here's a perfect example where he says, okay, well, here's what we're going to do with that. We're going to put things into a stacked bar chart um, and how easy it is to come up with some sort of quick visual understanding of the data held behind there where here you have to look at the color, you have to look up at the key. It's, it's just a mess. So over here in the lower left corner, Donna Wong is someone who said here, I'm going to just take all these different examples and one by one give you a detailed, list of de detailed description of here's the right way and here's the wrong way. Don't do your pie chart like this or do it like this. Uh, and that goes forward through all of the, the different styles of representing data that you would see in something like the Wall Street Journal. There's someone who has already come up with this and written down the list of rules. This is what you do, this is what you don't do. So. Uh, again, just furthering the, the, the grammar for as we move forward in time and we're representing more and more complicated data. And then the, in the lower right corner, um, one of the most significant contributions in terms of what we're working on to, uh, together in our company today, Mike Bostock, who uh, was one of the main authors of D3JS, and the, D th the three Ds stand for Data Driven Design. And so I'll be talking more about that and giving a brief demo of that as well. Um, my first day in Tokyo, I was out visiting a, a design-oriented bookstore and ended up taking this photo because I realized it was a perfect example of data visualization. And so here are these, these pictures that I took are now in our slideshow. And I wanted to point out that um, once I give you a brief explanation here, I think hopefully you'll agree with me that this is a quick, intuitive, narrative, and scalable way of presenting data. So the artist made up this series of life stripes, and they queried, it uh, looks like, maybe a couple hundred different uh, artists and designers, and they said, I want you to record what you do for one 24-hour period, and I'm going to key it by color and lay it out. 
Now, I'm not saying that I can look at this and understand exactly everything this person did all day long, but what it does give me is an immediate access to a story that I can relate to. I can think of the way that I spend my own days and how everyone else does as well. It has both similarities and overlap and also great differences. And all that is contained here in the larger view where I'm looking at hundreds of people's lives and I'm instantly making a narrative. I'm, I'm going into the data and making a story and making infer inferences. And if there's any one particular pattern that interests me, I can zoom into it or in this case, walk over to the piece of art and look at it and figure out stories about the person that I was uh, interested in looking at. So I found that to be extremely effective and inspiring. Um, so, you know, again, we're working with principles that, you know, are as old as Leonardo da Vinci and before that, but I just wanted to highlight three of his classic and beautiful images here. And what I see here are, I see in, in a static two-dimensional drawing, I see movement, I see layers, again, I see narrative. And um, these are just really, really inspiring ways of seeing how data is represented. So now we're going to go from the very old to, again, to the, the current and the modern. This, again, was on the Tokyo Metro. Uh, I was lucky enough to get here a, a full day and a half before the conference to have time to tour around. And I saw so many inspiring things around the city, and including some that were relevant to this talk. And this is something that I had read about uh, in one of Mike Bostock's, who again was the inventor of D3. He had talked about train table layouts as being a perfect stem and leaf chart. And again, even without reading too far into these charts or you know even without feeling overwhelmed by the fact that the chart is mainly in Japanese with some transliterations or translations in some case I instantly saw a story happening here and then where I wanted to zoom in and find out more I could just read the translations here and realize that this is a breakdown of weekends and weekdays train times for the the first trains and the back trains and you can see the shape being made here is a tapering up and a tapering down which in the back of my mind tells me, all right, around four things begin and around midnight they end. And if I'm on, at the station at 1 a.m., I'm in a capsule hotel or taking a very expensive cab. So I thought that was a great use of layout. Um, grouping things together with color, uh, conjunction of related data, um, over here we see motion and um, over in these bullet points these are just some of the again part of the the, the grammar or the vocabulary of design that are being applied here uh, this was the uh, I think it's the Yamanote line um, which is the ring metro and so much communicated here colored instantly drawing my eye to the location of the ring that I'm on numbers easily decodable for how many minutes it is for all the stops coming up. And so I just thought these were excellent examples to share. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to John, who's going to talk a little bit about the practice of these elements in our, in our research. Thanks, Alex. Um, we started working on Goldstone uh, a while ago, and, and the goal of Goldstone was to um, take in uh, data from OpenStack clouds and, and present it in... Uh, concise novel ways that that give you an overview of your cloud um, holistically and, and not you know not necessarily in a project by project sense but across uh, across all of the projects of OpenStack so um, it, it's it's a work in progress and we continually look at evolving some of the visualizations of, of clouds as we get better sense of what the data is and and the scale of the clouds that our customers uh, start to, to look at. Um, but on the left, you can uh, quickly see that we've got a visualization of, of all the, uh, a region in a cloud with all the key projects, uh, Nova, Neutron, Cinder Glance, uh, Keystone, and, and all the things that, um, uh, the resources that are, are within those projects. And, and you can quickly navigate 
to the configuration of all those things and see what's going on. Um, this is, um, so as a, as a developer of the product, I look at this and go, oh boy, you know, I mean, I get to a table at the end and it's not really, you know, not really scalable, but, but it resonates with people. People can get a quick sense of the structure of OpenStack by, by looking at this little tree. Um, we've got some other things, you know, something that's just a, a log flow that we use a lot just to see uh, if, if logs are being generated anomalously fast or, or slow. Um, and then you can quickly look at logs and search and sort those things. And, and then one that I like um, particularly, even though um, uh, my math background tells me that it's not really valuable, is the little API uh, performance graph. So, you know, we're, we're presenting the average and the min and the max of, of API calls for a, for a particular type of call across the cloud. And, and you can quickly see um, whether things are performing fairly consistently or if they're trending towards slower, if you've got spikes of, uh, spikes of problems. And, you know, as we go through, we look at this and go, okay, what would I do with it next? Well, one, I might want to condense it and give you some different views of, of these things to show how, um, how this current data, this, you know, 15-minute view or hour view is, is comparing to uh, a monthly view, for instance, or on a, on a day scale, is this is Tuesday just like last Tuesday or the Tuesday before, you know, do I see seasonality kind of patterns in data? Um, so, uh, you know, one day, you know, we might have something that looks more like this where we take advantage of, of these scaled up complex uh, views. So we, we talk about these things and when we have time and when we have the data, we'll go model one of these and, and Alex is going to show us uh, a couple examples or an example of, of some of the stuff that we've done with, with one of these and how we started to think about it. Um, and this, you know, again, wouldn't be possible very easily without the D3 package. It's, it's really amazing how, um, how a community of folks who like data visualiza visualization have come together and just put out um, a, a great set of, of potential visualizations for different purposes that we can draw from and go, okay, does this meet our needs for, you know, presenting the data concisely, you know, scaled, um, you know, and what are its limits? Um, um, Along the way, I mean, we're, uh, well, first of all, how many folks operate clouds here? Um, so we've got cloud operators, and, and then on the other side of the coin, how many folks are software vendors um, providing software for clouds? Okay, so uh, for, for those of us on the software vendor side, you know, we, we typically don't have giant clouds in our environment to work with, so one of the things we have to do is, is think about what real-world data looks like and try to model that data. Um, so, so our process kind of looks like, hey, you know, we have these metrics, we think we want to tell a story. And, uh, you know, the first thing I'll try to do is understand the shape of this data and, and uh, use, um, use statistical distributions to, to represent that shape. So, for example, uh, a Poisson distribution. Uh, by the way, my math background is so old that, that I'm just like drawing, you know, I do a lot of research to figure out what this all means. But the a Poisson distribution is good for modeling the flow of events over time. So, you know, on average I have 100 events that occur in an hour. If I want to sort of, um, you know, do a probabilistic projection of that, I might use a Poisson distribution and say that, you know, I have an average of 100 and I have a, a range that, that comes out and I get a, a, a unique pattern of data every time I run the simulation. Um, if I have a set of resources that I can look at in my cloud and see patterns of, of action, uh, you know, uh, initiators and targets of an of a API connection or something like that, and, and I happen to have, you know, 25 users in my cloud, but I want to create a visualization for 150 users, I can look at the distribution of, of those, um, uh, those resources in, the, in my real data and then scale that up using one of these statistical models. Um, so, so defining your target scale is important, and then it's pretty straightforward to use tools like uh, NumPy and Pandas and things like this because they have all that statistics stuff built in. So, you know, with a little, a little web browsing about the API usage, you can quickly generate a set of data that's fairly realistic for a, for a scaled up cloud um, as a proxy for actually having a scaled up cloud to work with. And then you can generate that data and, and visualize it and see how your visualization performs at that scale. And, and if it works great, you know, you've hit it, you know, <laughs> try number one, fantastic. If it doesn't, then you, you know, iterate and, and figure out how to, how to modify things to get a better visualization. Um, 
So I'm going to turn it back over to Alex for, for a little demo of some of this stuff, uh, and then um, we'll, we'll wrap it up and leave you guys some time for questions and answers. Okay, thanks. All right, so I just have to turn on mirroring. <coughs> And let's make sure. Okay. D3JS in five minutes or less. We'll see how long <laughs> this takes. Now, I wanted to, um, apologies for speaking above or below anybody here. I'm going to try to make this narrative and not, so that it doesn't matter whether you're a programmer or not, and just give you block by block what's going on in this relatively simple D3 visualization here. Um, and again, uh, do you, you've see already seen some D3 images in the slides and we're going to show you it in action in Goldstone as well. So here's just some basic code for telling your computer browser that you're about, sorry, your internet browser that you are about to give it some instructions. Uh, here's some scripts that say, okay, here's some basic variables for margins, widths, and heights. And this one I want to highlight, um, data. We're just starting with data. It's just a container, nothing in it at all. And then now all of a sudden I'm putting one thing in there. And that is what you're seeing here on the screen over here on the right. It's that one thing that I put in there. That's right from the start. And now when it comes to D3, um, I'm setting up uh, some graphics that are that work right out of the box with the browser. This is called SVG. Again, I know many people here are already familiar with this. Um, I'm putting in a group on that SVG, and then I'm using D3 now all of a sudden for the first time, saying, set me up some scales here that if I give you one number in, you give me a number out, and I want it to be within this range, and the numbers I'm going to give you are going to be within this range. So for example, if, if we were going to convert uh, yen to dollars roughly, we're going to say, if I give you a thousand, give me back uh, one. Okay, so, I'm sorry, ten. <laughs> um, you want to do business with me, right? <laughs> Okay, so uh, again, for X and Y scales, we're doing, we're saying, give me back things within a certain range. And here's a, here's a sample. If I set up a linear D3 scale, range 0 to 100, domain 0 to 1,000, and then I, I convert 10 within that system, it gives me 100, 2.5 turns into 25. Um, feel free to, you know, just follow along and just keep these rough ideas in your mind. Um, and now I am putting in some axes for the X and Y axes. And then here is where I put the first rectangle on the screen. Okay, so now I add a click listener because I put a button here. And every time I click that, I want to put a new random data point in that container I mentioned of data. Uh, and then I update that part of the scale w where I said, um, hey, I said, remember when I told you to give me back uh, numbers between here and here? I said, well, here's the numbers that are going in. That's changed now because I've added some new data. And then I want you to add another bar. Um, and then there's some D3 specific things that are going to happen. Anyway, so to see that in action, we can see down here in the console, I'm asking the browser to let me know what data is being inserted every time I hit this button. So now I've got 2 and 66. And lo and behold, where we originally saw only the 2 filling up the entire box, D3 has automatically computed for me. Well, now I better be able to represent the entire data set, so I better scale things. Press it again. Now I've got... Um, See, I'm having a little trouble with the mirroring. Apologies. Okay, now, now I've got a 15, so that was less than my maximum. Scale doesn't need to change. 67, oh, that's a little bit higher now. So the 66 has moved down slightly, and so on and so forth. 
it's updating the scales to fit the data that's going in. And down here at the bottom, it's also showing how many elements are in there. Each time I click that, we see a new element being entered. And I can keep going if I want. Now, that would be what we consider a very unscalable uh, system of representing data. So I also included something in here to prune out any da anything from the data set if it gets larger than six. So let's just do that again quickly. Now we only have the last six data points that were generated. And if you look to the left uh, and notice the y-axis, you'll see it adjusting itself to accommodate for the largest data set. Now this is very jumpy. Um, this is basically um, the next step of taking just a static display of data. There's nothing all that exciting about it. How do we use um, all the tools at our disposal to actually tell a story about how this data is changing rather than just see one thing jumping to another? Well, that's where D3 comes in. And if, we, if I uncomment what's known as uh, transition, now all of a sudden we put a time element into that change. And now it's defaulting to, I think, 250 milliseconds for each of those changes. And something that was previously hidden was that when that sixth element is pruned off, when the new one comes in, we see there's something that's turning red and flipping off the screen. So what if I want to make th just that part take a little longer? Well, I go into what's called the exit selection within D D3, and I can very specifically change things just in there. What if, and these are milliseconds here. What if I tell it, well, take, take a second to get rid of that last element. There, now it's sort of creeping off the screen in a second. Anyway, that's just uh, to show you the flexibility of data that's coming in, data that's already on the screen, and data that's leaving the screen. Um, what I want to show you now is a quick example of that working in Goldstone uh, when we are bringing in cloud data. Right now I'm showing uh, event counts for the last 15 minutes of with an API, API calls across our cloud. If I change the look back to an hour, well, we see things smoothly change. And if I look at back at six hours, we see that I've only been running this cloud on my laptop uh, since you know, 10 this morning. So that's where the data ends. We can zoom in by changing it to an hour and even further with the last 15 minutes. And you, over here, the X and Y scales have been updating themselves accordingly. So that's just a little bit of an explanation behind the, you know, what is not actually magic, but um, is a system of declarative or functional programming that Mike Bostock created to abstract away all of the, what's going on underneath the hood for us. Um, next piece of our demo uh, is what's called a chord diagram. And as John was talking about creating appropriate data sets in order to model real life cloud applications, uh, he used some of the, the Python uh, data generation tools that he mentioned, as well as some of the distributions to simulate what if we had a number of users in a cloud and we needed to figure out how many of them were potentially, uh, you know, potential hackers who have gotten into our system and were uh, making requests that were mainly failing. So on the front end, I coded up something that would say, well, not only do I want you to draw me all the connections between users and the endpoints, but if there was a failure rate of greater than 80%, make them stand out all in red. So we see that, um, I can't read their names because in order to fit all these on here, I had to make it too small, but these two individuals here have, oh, sorry, it's Lorraine <laughs> and Jules. They have been busted by the system of taking really what is just, you know, needle in a haystack kind of data until you start to make pictures about it. And we realize that we can create narratives and stories and look deeper into the data that is otherwise literally incomprehensible. Um, and another example I wanted to show you briefly is this is 
uh, not something that I created. Um, and again, this one here, I also want to give credit to Mike Bostock, the creator of D3. I have merely adapted one of his visualizations to our data. Um, D3 is one of the most amazingly documented um, systems which have tons of examples. So there's lots of great starting places which you can then adapt to your own uh, data sets. This co-occurrence matrix, I just want to show you um, a transition within D3 in play here. The problem with this here is that no matter how long I've been looking at this and thinking about what it represents, um, it's a co-occurrence of the characters in the novel Les Mis. I still haven't been able to figure out what it's actually saying. So this is where we have to be careful between bells and whistles and actually clear narratives. So if you uh, feel so moved to figure this out, you can go on d3.org and look at the examples page, and you'll see this amongst many other incredible examples. And then when you've got it sorted, just let us know. Email us, reach out to us on Twitter. Let yeah, us know how you interpreted that. Indeed. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to John after I can turn off the uh, mirroring. Excuse me. Okay, and now I just have to start the slideshow again. There you go. Play from current slide. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alex. Good time check. Okay, so uh, we'll just sort of wrap things up here and, and sort of bring together some of the some of the recurring themes or thoughts throughout here. One is that you know in order to do good data visualization, you need to have a good understanding of the data you're visualizing as well as the audience that you want to present that data to. So um, the Limis thing is a good example of, hey, we've got an awesome data set, uh, but uh, clearly I, I'm not a, a literature expert, so just looking at it, I don't understand what um, you know what that means without probably doing some deeper research into, into the data on my own, which is maybe not a great um, place to uh, start if you're trying to create operational tools for folks who aren't software developers or statisticians or uh, you know, mathematicians. So, so we spent a good deal of time trying to, to grind through that and, and make visual visualizations that actually solve operational problems, not solve statistics problems. Um, uh, another good point is that, you know, um, there are a wealth of, uh, of tools out there, especially in the D3 space that have already been created and that, you know, we can accelerate uh, development by using those things and, and not reinventing the wheel. The, the, the framework is there, um, you know, we just need to take our data, apply it, figure out the story you tell and then, and then create that story. Um, and uh, it, it's quick enough uh, with data generation, with even real cloud generated data to do that in an agile way um, and that we should keep a, you know, a healthy curiosity about about the environments that that our products go into and that um, that the data comes out of, um, and and sort of to be to be patient, you know, it's 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 not quite needle in this haystack hunting, but it, it takes a while to get a good sense of these things so that you can create real meaningful and useful visualizations that that you know that someone can look at and go, ah, this is important. Not only do I get it, um, it's useful to me right now, um, and, and so that's what we're striving for. And, and it's very evolutionary um, in, in that you know we'll continue to work on evolving these things as as we learn more and as we learn more about how you know how customers use data. So with that, I'll, I'll just say thanks uh, on behalf of myself and Alex for your time. Um, there's some some a few minutes for questions uh, out there, and so if anybody has some, I will. Uh, Here's a question over here, um, and then I'll, I'll put a shameless plug for Selenia hiring people up here. Uh, we're looking for engineers, we're looking for consultants, we're looking for all kinds of folks that are in the open stack and open infrastructure space. So, uh, a couple questions. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions is uh, D3, what's the licensing there? Is it uh, Apache license? Uh, it's either Apache or MIT. I'd have to look, uh, but it, it it's, was, open. It's, it's, it's open definitely, and um, it, it, was, it was friendly uh, friendly to Apache. Uh, and I heard you mention SVG. Is it 100% SVG based, or does it also use some HTML5 specific graphic? Um, I believe it is agnostic. And you just have to uh, figure out how to do the data joins within D3. I've only been working on it 
in SVG, but I understand people are using it for Canvas as well. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so D3, what, what it does is it takes that data and binds it to your DOM. So whatever your DOM is, right? if you're using SVG elements in your DOM, you can bind data to SVG elements. If you're using Canvas elements, you can do that. If you were using HTML5 elements, you could bind that data into those elements as well. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, do you plan eventually to have your work be used for like visi visualization of the cellometer data? Like for example, do you show like alerts, which they do, or uh, Nova performance? So is your product like totally separate for, from the Horizon UI or from the cellometer UI, or do you plan to merge at one point? Um, so we have, uh, we have a standalone user interface that, that leverages some of that data as well as data that we get from the notification bus and from other places. But um, we have also done some experiments with, with SysPanel and, and um, you know, making panels in Horizon. Um, we haven't taken it very far yet, uh, but I, I wouldn't rule it out in the future. Other questions? Your GitHub project Goldstone, where is most of the data sourced from? Is it already from Silometer? Or can you put some light on that? And does it introduce any kind of overheads into the default configuration or operation of OpenStack? Yeah, so uh, we do two things. Um, we adjust settings for the notification buses in, in the various products um, so that um, they're they're actually turned on, uh, and and you know, so so event data gets pushed to the notification bus, and we'll get that. We also use Solometer data uh, coming directly out of Solometer, and we use uh, our syslog to point our syslog data at our server uh, for ingestion. So basically, at our log stash interface to ingest that data. Um, n of those things. I suppose the syslog thing might have some impact uh, because you're setting up a remote syslog uh, setting rather than dumping it to log files on the machine. Um, uh, to be quite candid, I haven't measured the impact of that stuff yet, so I, I can't tell you how, how significant it is, but it's probably not that significant. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? Okay, I think we're about one minute over our time. Uh, so thank you again for your time. Thank you. I hope you enjoy the rest of your summit.